If you keep blindly following the system like the majority of people are doing, you're going to end up like the majority of people. And you don't want to do that. So what I want to do today is go over the five biggest ways that the system is keeping so many people poor right now that we can stop doing these things and stop living like the majority of people. So let's start with number one. First, there's no financial education when we're growing up and going to school. Now, this one is particularly close to my heart because I always wanted to be successful. My parents are immigrants that came to this country with not that much and I always saw how hard my parents worked. So growing up, I wanted to become successful so I can give back to my parents and give them things that they never had. So I assumed that the way that you become successful is by studying hard in school, by getting good grades, that we can get a good job. In my house, that meant that I needed to go out and become a doctor. You know, your typical Indian stereotype. Along the way, I realized that I didn't want to be a doctor. I wanted to be an entrepreneur and I wanted to be an investor, but my parents didn't really like that. So they compromised. They said, if you're not going to be a doctor, you have to at least be an attorney. So I went through college, I went through law school, and I went through all the schooling to learn how to become successful, but never once did I learn about money. I never learned about how to manage my money. I never learned about how to invest my money. And I never learned how to build wealth in the economic system that we have right now. The first bit of financial education that every single person needs to understand, especially if you live in America, is that there are two different ways that you can make money. You can make money from your labor, and then you can make money from your capital. You have to understand this if you want to be able to build wealth because our education system and our schooling teach us how to maximize the income that we make here from our labor. You go to school to get good grades, to get a good degree, that way you can get a good job. This is the money you make from your labor. You go to work to get paid. Now, the idea of you going to school is so you can get a high paying job. You go and you become a doctor, you become an attorney, you become an accountant, you become an engineer. You're a high paid worker or you're a high paid employee. But in the economic system that we have right now, the highest paid people and the most financially successful people in the country are not high paid workers, it's people that know how to deploy their capital. Let me show you what I mean. So this is what school teaches us how to maximize. This is our corporate ladder. You go from analyst to associate to VP to director to the CEO, you go to the C levels. So school wants us to climb the corporate ladder. But what people who understand the economic system understand is they don't want to just climb the corporate ladder, they want to own the corporate ladder. Remember, we live in a capitalist society. This says it in the name. Now you can hate it or love it. The reality is we live in a capitalist society. In the name, it tells you that if you want to become successful, you have to deploy your capital. It's in the name. So the people who become insanely successful understand this and they're working to grow this. They want to invest their capital because now it's your money working to increase value instead of just your labor. There's a limit to how much you can work. There's a limit to how much value you can provide directly from your labor alone, but there's no limit to what you can do with your capital. This is where a lot of people get upset because they say, I'm disadvantaged. I don't have rich parents. I wasn't born into a lot of money. So how am I supposed to take advantage of the system? But what you need to understand is you need to use your labor to generate capital. That way you can use and deploy this capital. That way you can become wealthy in this economic system. Most people, the majority, majority of people are working for a bigger salary. That's what they assume is going to make them wealthy. But that's a lie. Our economic system has it in its name, capitalist. The way you become wealthy is by using your capital. That way you can earn a piece of profits. See, let me explain this because it took me a long time to understand how this truly worked. I had to read a lot of books, I had to talk to a lot of people, and I had to experience it myself because this is something I never grew up learning. When you work a job, you're getting paid for the labor that you put in. Now, you could be a high paid person, you could be a low paid person, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it's the same thing. You're working for the owner of the company. You can get paid a lot of money as an employee. Doctors make a lot of money, you have executives that make a lot of money, but at the end of the day, you're still working for the owner of the company. Now, there's a difference between the salary, the income you make, and the profit that a company generates. The profit is separate from your income. Now, what these people here, the investors, the people who deploy the capital are working for, it's not an income, it's not a salary, it's profit. They're working for a piece of the profit. So I'll give you an example. Let's assume that I go out and I start a company. And my company makes a million dollars in revenue. 
So I sell, for some fun, I sell avocados. I sell guacamole, okay? I make a million dollars in revenue from my guacamole company, but I don't get to keep all the money in profit. I have expenses to pay. Maybe I have $100,000 in avocado costs. I have $200,000 in employee costs. And then I have another, say, $200,000 in other expenses. So I have to pay my CEO. I have to pay the people that mash the avocados. I have to pay for the salt, the pepper, and everything else. This all adds up to $500,000 in expenses. Now, I have to pay the team in order to run the company. Right? I gotta pay my CEO, I gotta pay the people that work in the actual avocado to guacamole making business. That's my cost. You're getting paid for your labor. And if you're really good at making avocados into guacamole, you're gonna get paid more money. But once all the expenses are paid, there's another half a million dollars in the bank account. The person who gets this is the owner of the company because now you own the equity. Now you do have more and more companies nowadays that are distributing some of this ownership, the profit to the employees like here at my minority mindset companies like at Market Briefs. We do a revenue share system where the employees get to share in the profits. But if you don't have that, what you need to understand is this is what wealthy people are working for. They're not working just to grow this by 5% or 6%. They want to see how can we drive more sales that way we can get a bigger piece of ownership. And the way that you can do that is by working for this. This might be investing in companies. It might be investing in your own company. If you have that sort of equity structure, it might mean investing in real estate or investing in startups. You want to use your money to buy assets, investments. That way you can build equity either in companies or real estate or some other sort of asset. That way now you can be the equity owner and get a share of this because now when you're working for profits now you have the team of people working to help grow the value in the company now there's another debate that a lot of people talk about this how much money should an employee be earning you have all the time people talking about minimum wage how much money people should be earning people should be earning more money and that's fine but what you need to understand now as the financially educated person is a concept called fiduciary duty I learned this in law school and it was a new concept that I didn't understand. Fiduciary duty is who you owe your alliance to, who you need to take care of first. An easy way to understand fiduciary duty is think of it like this. You have a date scheduled with your wife tonight and then one of your friends calls you and asks if you can play video games with them tonight. You can't cancel on your wife to play video games with your friend because your fiduciary duty is to your wife first. Well, in this case, in this corporate ladder, the executive's corporate duty the people who run the company, the executive's corporate duty is not to the employees, it's to the shareholders. It's to these people. So the number one goal of the people that's running the company is to drive this, the profit higher. It's not to pay the employees the maximum amount possible, it's to drive up the profit. Now, you have to understand, there's a moral aspect to this, there's a legal aspect to this, there's a financial aspect to this. You want to make sure that your employees are happy. You want to make sure your employees are well taken care of. That way they want to come to work every single day. That way they want to produce a good product. But if you are just working here, you're going to be constantly asking and wondering why you're not getting paid more money. But what you have to understand is the way the system works is designed to benefit this person. It's designed to benefit the person who's working for this not just the person that's working for this. So you can do two things. Either you can go and work for a company that's gonna treat you better, or, or I guess, and or, you can work for earning more of this. That way you can deploy your capital. That way you can own equity in companies and real estate. That way you can build your wealth by understanding how the system works. This is why financial education is so important. And this is one thing that I wish, I wish schools would have taught me and I wish schools would be teaching this to people nowadays so we can understand how to win in this system because rich people and wealthy people understand this, but most of us are never taught this. The second thing that's keeping so many people poor is this overconsumption that way we can look rich so people think that we're successful. Growing up, my parents worked their butt off. They were working around the clock, seven days a week. And I remember when we used to go to family get togethers, my parents would always tell me and my little brother that we need to wear a polo shirt. We had a few shirts that were nicer from the polo company that had that little horse on it. And they would always say, make sure that you can see the horse, get a shirt that has the horse on it. That would people think that you're successful. 
successful and they know that you're successful because you have a polo shirt on. Now, I didn't really understand much about what was going on at the time, but I listened to what my mom said and I wore these polo shirts. Now, we were not broke by any means. Like, I never worried about where my next meal was gonna come from. I was never worried about how we were gonna pay for the bills, but my parents were still working their butt off. Like, they were working around the clock. My dad would barely even get holidays off, but the whole idea was at least you look like you're successful. Now, fast forward to today, I've achieved a much different level of success, and I don't remember the last time I bought something with that horse on it, the polo. I mean, I like some polo clothes. If I like something, I'll buy it, but I have no need or urgency to go out and buy this or to show it off. And I talked to my dad about this, and he does most of his shopping at Costco now, and he laughs about it because it was this whole idea of trying to look more successful than you actually are. And the number one reason why so many people are broke today is because you're spending all of your money trying to look rich. The first time I had more than a thousand dollars in my bank account, I was in high school from all these side gigs that I was running. And as soon as I had a thousand dollars in my bank account, I immediately went out and I bought the shiniest, most sparkliest watch that I could find. It was a one thousand dollar watch. I took all the money that I had and I went out and I bought this watch. It was covered in crystals. I still have that watch. I really need to bring it onto YouTube so you can see it. But I bought this stupid watch that way I would look rich. But in actuality, that watch was keeping me broke. This single mindset of trying to look rich before you're actually rich is what keeps so many people broke because what happens is you make money and then you have to make sure that everybody else around you is rich before you are rich yourself. So as soon as you get paid, you make sure that Apple gets paid, you make sure that Lululemon gets paid, you make sure that Gucci gets paid, you make sure that Amazon gets paid, you make sure that everybody else gets paid, and then you're left with the scraps. Once you break out of that mindset, then it almost becomes a game of trying to figure out how you can stop spending so much money on things that you don't need. Third is a concept of overfinancing. So something that I like to say is that traditionally, Indian people make a dollar to spend 20 cents, while American people make a dollar to spend two dollars thanks to the help of credit cards and lines of credit. Now, neither of these things are right or the best thing that you can do with your money, but what you need to understand is we live in a spending culture. Our culture is designed to make you spend money, which is why you need to have this financial education and understand how this works. That way you don't go into debt to buy a whole bunch of things that you don't need because now you are a slave to your banks. You owe your banks money and anytime you get paid, the first thing you do is you buy all the stuff that you don't need and then you pay off your banks and then Whatever's left is what you use to build your wealth. And at that rate, you will never become wealthy because all of your money is going out to make your banker rich and it's going out to make Amazon, Lululemon, and Gucci rich. The simplest way for me to explain this is if it does not put any money in your pocket, you should not be financing it, period. If you don't have the money to buy it in full in cash, you can't afford it yet. This includes doing 0% APR on your phone and financing your car. If you don't have the money to buy these things outright, you should not be going into debt to buy them because these things are not going to make you any more money. Now, I understand you can use your phone in your business. I understand you can use your car to get to and from work. But if you don't have the money to afford it, don't go into debt to buy it. I get it. You need a phone for your business. Maybe go back a couple generations of iPhones. That way you can buy it for a few hundred dollars instead of paying a thousand dollars that you finance over time. And even though it's 0% APR, there's a reason why 0% APR is so profitable for banks and companies. When you go out and you buy a bunch of things with 0% APR, you don't feel that pain of spending money because a thousand dollars isn't leaving your account today, you're just putting it on a payment plan for the next 12 months, and then you can go out and buy even more things with the help of 0% APR. So now you're going out and buying a whole bunch of things that you wouldn't have otherwise, and now you're putting all these things on 0% APR, and then what happens for so many people is you don't pay off your items, you don't pay off your cell phone and everything else in time, so now you get slapped with an 18 to 25% APR interest rate, and now you're stuck back in the payments game, trying to pay off your banker, trying to pay off these companies, that way you can finally have some freedom back. Now you can use debt to make you wealthier, but wealthy people are not going into debt to buy their cell phone. Wealthy people are not going into debt to buy a car that they can't actually afford. Wealthy people are using debt to make themselves wealthier by using this money to finance assets, which are making them money instead of financing liabilities, which are losing them money. And this brings me to number four. You're confusing assets for liabilities. And let me diagram this out for you that it's very easy to understand. An asset is something that puts money in your pocket, a liability, I'm just gonna shorten that, is something that takes money out of your pocket. 
This part is pretty simple to understand, but what happens is many of us are confusing liabilities for assets. Let me give you an example of this. Your home is what everybody calls your biggest asset. That is where you will be able to build generational wealth. This is why we want to push home ownership for all Americans. Now listen, I'm a real estate investor. I have a real estate salesperson's license. I used to help people buy and sell homes and I'm an attorney. I've seen this from a lot of different angles. And when I was getting my real estate license back when I was 20 years old, one of the first things they teach you when it comes time to selling real estate is how you are gonna help so many people buy the biggest investment of their life their home. We are bred to think that your home is an asset. We are bred to think that our home is an investment. But wealthy people don't look at the home that they live in as an asset. Wealthy people look at the home that they live in as a liability because it's not putting any money in your pocket every single month. Your home is a money pit. Now sure, maybe when you go and sell your home, you'll be able to sell it for a profit. But it's not guaranteed. We don't know when you're gonna sell your home and you only get that money when it comes time for you to sell your home. Up until then, your home is a money pit. Every single year, you gotta pay your property taxes. Every single year, you gotta pay for your maintenance. Every time you wanna upgrade the kitchen or the bathroom or your kid's room, it's gonna cost you money. You have to pay to fix the roof when the wind damages it and you have to pay to fix that window when somebody throws a ball through it. But if I can sell you on this idea that your home is a big asset and it's gonna be the biggest investment that you ever purchase, now what are you gonna do? You're gonna stretch yourself a little bit thinner that we can go out and buy a bigger home because now it's an asset. You're gonna be able to give your kids this home one day. So now you go out and buy something a little bit bigger. Your debt payments are a little bit bigger, which means you have less money every single month to invest into assets, but at least you have a home. And now every single month, you're working to build equity in your home, you're working to pay off your property taxes, you're working to pay off your utilities, you're working to pay off the insurance. And then when it comes time for you to sell your home, hopefully you will have some equity in the deal. If it all works out, you will be able to sell your home for a profit and now you'll be able to put some money in your pocket, but you're still gonna need another place to live. But what you have to understand is why did you buy that home in the first place? Did you buy that home to make money or did you buy it to make memories? If you're buying a home to live in, you're buying it to make memories. You're not buying it to make money on. While wealthy people understand that the home that you live in is a place where you make memories. Sure, if you make some money on it, great, but that's not the reason why they're buying the home. They're buying the home to make memories. If I wanna make money in real estate, I'm not gonna go out and buy a big home to live in. I'm gonna go out and buy a rental property because my rental property I'm buying for the sole purpose of making money. If you really wanna make money from a home, buy a home that you can rent out for somebody else instead of buying a big home for you to live in yourself. So what you have to understand is your home is a liability more than it is an asset. It is a liability until you sell it and if you sell it, hopefully you'll be able to sell it for a profit. But what happens to so many people is we fall in love with the idea of owning a home and then we want a really nice home, we want a bigger home. So now we stretch ourselves thinner and thinner and thinner and now we're living paycheck to paycheck. That way we can just own a home, but hey, at least you're building some equity in your home, right? Well, if you weren't doing that, you lived smaller and you didn't think of your home as an asset, you didn't think of your home as the biggest investment that you'd ever make, well now you'd have more money every single month to invest your money into assets, to invest your money to actually build equity into real estate investment properties, to to build equity into companies that where now you can build real wealth instead of just working your butt off to buy a big home, which is only really making your real estate broker, your mortgage broker, and your banker richer while it's keeping you broke because now you're having to work overtime just to make the mortgage payments. Remember, assets are things that you buy to make you money. Liabilities are things that take money away from you. Wealthy people put their emphasis here to own more assets and put less emphasis here. In fact, what wealthy people actually do is they put their emphasis here that where the assets buy them their liabilities. They use their investments to pay for their expenses. And last, but definitely not least, is understanding this idea of our money. What are you working for? Most of the time we assume that our paper dollars is money, but the reality is our paper dollars don't store value very well. Think of it this way. You work hard at your job all year and you make $50,000. Now let's assume that you take this $50,000 that you earn and you print it in cash. Now you have this $50,000 in cash and let's assume you could put it in a duffel bag and now you have a time machine. So you go in this time machine, you take the $50,000 worth of cash and now we go forward 30 years. What do you think is gonna happen if we go forward 30 years with this $50,000? Do you think that $50,000 will be able to buy you the same things that you can today? No, probably not. Chances are in 30 years that $50,000 that you earn today is going to be able to buy you way less in the future than it can today because of something called inflation. That's why the value of dollars keep dropping and the prices of everything keep going up. 
But let's go backwards now. Let's assume that you have this $50,000 in cash and we can go backwards in time. We'll go back 30 years. Now, do you think this $50,000 is gonna be able to buy you the same things that it can today? No. If we go back 30 years, you're gonna be able to buy way more stuff with that $50,000 than you can today because $50,000 30 years ago had way more buying power than $50,000 does today. So now, if you're working for this money, this paper dollars, and you just keep stacking and saving this money because that's what we're told to do, at least that's what I was told, was I was supposed to work hard and then save as much money as possible. Well, this money that you're saving isn't growing because your bank isn't paying you any interest. It's actually losing value every single day. Your savings are losing value, effectively making you poorer each and every day just by saving your money because inflation is way higher than what interest your bank is paying you. Money at its core definition is supposed to be some sort of store of value. So you earn $50,000 because of this labor that you put in and the money that you have is supposed to store this $50,000. But our paper dollars don't do that. Our paper dollars are really just a means of exchange. It's a type of currency. It's a way for us to exchange our money. It's a way for us to buy things and do transactions with, but it's not a good way for you to store your money. That's why I call it fake money. What real money is, is a way for you to store the value of the earnings that you got. Traditionally, this would be something like physical gold because gold is a store of value. It takes time, effort, and labor to mine an ounce of gold. And if you own some physical gold, you own a real representation or a real store of value. That's what gold is. We used to be on the gold standard here in the United States, meaning every dollar used to be a gold certificate. But we're no longer on the gold standard. In 1971, President Richard Nixon severed the dollar and the gold standard, which means you could no longer exchange one dollar bill for a specific ounce of gold. Now, the dollar is separate from gold, which means that the government can print as much money as they want, the government can print as many dollars as they want, which effectively dilutes the value of each dollar, which makes the value of your money, your paper dollars that you're working so hard to earn, that you're working so hard to save, diluted each and every day. We just talked about the difference between a liability and an asset, but this is one of the reasons why it's so important for you to convert your dollars into assets, not just so you can become wealthy, not just so you can create cash flow, not just so you can take advantage of the system that we're in, but so you can actually preserve the value of your money. Because if you don't, your money is gonna lose value each and every day in the bank, and this is what's happening to so many people. Inflation is known as a hidden tax. It's a tax on people that don't understand what inflation is. It's a tax on the financially uneducated because as inflation continues to be very high, the value of your savings will continue to lose value each and every day, effectively making you poorer. So the people who paid this tax are the people that don't understand what inflation is. That's why it's a hidden tax. It's a silent tax. It's a tax on people who are financially uneducated. So if I haven't convinced you about the importance of investing your money because of the capitalist system that we're in, or if I haven't convinced you to invest your money, that way you can own assets instead of liabilities, or if I haven't convinced you to invest your money, that way you don't keep making every other company around you rich, hopefully this will be the reason why. Because if you don't invest that money, if you just own liabilities, if you just stack cash, well, that cash is gonna make you poorer each and every day because the value of your dollars are dropping while the price of everything around you keeps getting more expensive, which is why if you want to at least preserve the value of your money, or if you want to grow the money you have, you need to own assets. That means owning shares of companies, stocks, or owning some physical real estate actual assets, which will help to preserve, if not grow, the value of your wealth. Now, does this mean that every investment that you make is gonna make you money? No, of course not. Investing has risks, but not investing has risks as well. Because if you don't invest your money, well, then your savings are gonna to continue to lose value to inflation each and every day. What is the tax rate going to be on the $100,000 worth of income? The first question that they're gonna ask you is how did you make this money? Because if you made this $100,000 from your job, you're gonna have one tax rate. If you made this $100,000 from your stock market investments, it's gonna have a completely different tax bill. And if you made this $100,000 from your real estate investments, it's gonna 